Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, Managing Editor of Shadowproof.com. I also curate the Dissenter newsletter, which covers whistleblower stories. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. And a lot of gratitude to Deepa for organizing this, uh, facilitating it, and inviting this incredible lineup of speakers to participate. I think a few points that need to be really focused on is the fact that this weaponization of whistleblowing for so-called great power competition is ongoing. I started my show, The Dissenter Weekly, in order to amplify and produce media coverage of whistleblower stories that neoliberals or right-wing partisans do not find worthy enough to give attention because they do not offer them political advantages. I paired this weekly show with my newsletter. And I put together this coverage because we hear a lot about whistleblowers when they serve uh, Democrats or they serve Republicans. But those whistleblowers who dare to stand up to empire are silenced. Those people who challenge corporate power get crushed. And now we need to look at the Biden administration and recognize that those whistleblowers who are going to be darlings of political elites or embraced by media are going to be those who claim to be exposing China or Russia. It's unfortunate that whistleblowers are going to have to struggle with geopolitics um, and maybe even to a greater extent than they did under President Trump. But having declared this great power competition so crucial to American superpower, what you see is that those whistleblowers who are on the wrong side of that are going to be marginalized and they will be targeted and nobody is going to stand up for them. And then those people who are actually on the right side are likely to find that they have an easier time dissenting. And that dissent is probably going to be within a narrow confines of what agencies would allow them to, to object to. Let's consider who has the freedom to dissent and to blow the whistle. Elites like John Brennan, who was the CIA director, Leon Panetta, former CIA director and Pentagon chief, James Clapper, who was the director of national intelligence, Michael Vickers, or David Petraeus, a former four-star general, did not face the same consequences for leaking information that may divert ever so slightly from a political agenda, which is to say that what they exposed didn't really threaten anybody in power. The people who have their lives destroyed or eternally upended are almost always lower level government employees or contractors. They do not have easy access to the halls of power. They are not immediately considered credible by journalists and news editors as a result of their position and authority. They often lack the social safety net and stability in their life to withstand the sustained assault of the US Justice Department when targeted for investigation and prosecution. When we talk about democratization, let's think about how essential it is for that democratization of whistleblowing to take place. Let's let, as we talk about democracy, we need a democratization of whistleblowing. This democratization depends on shifting cultural attitudes around what is and is not appropriate for someone to do if they dare to expose corruption. For example, in the US, there is an inordinate focus on the so-called proper channels which are available, yet those very channels could easily out you a potential whistleblower as a dissenting voice. It's fair to say if Chelsea Manning had gone to her superiors and said she wanted the public to see the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs and the entire database of US diplomatic cables because it contained information we needed to know, we would not have these materials to benefit our understanding of how US empire functions. And the same goes for NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. He could not go to an inspector general or any senator and convince them to enter the files he disclosed into a public record. And so as we consider this concept of 
democracy, part of our challenge is to change this attitude that says that someone has to sacrifice themselves, essentially, in order to be a whistleblower, that uh, people have to go through some sort of rules or regulations in order to reveal information. We have to break free from the kind of official secrets laws that hamper our ability to learn about the corruption of governments and to enforce accountability. As we talk about solidarity, one thing I think that is crucial to pay attention is the lack of solidarity with whistleblowers in journalism. Leak prosecutions and any other form of corporate government retaliation against whistleblowers impacts the press by creating a chilling effect. Less potential sources are willing to speak to media guidelines or gag orders that instruct employees or contractors not to speak with press unless authorized contribute to the spread of corruption. But the only time we have seen the press collectively object to the use of the Espionage Act by the U.S. Justice Department is in the case of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. But even in that case, they offer a kind of opaque solidarity. Under the delusion of losing a sheen of objectivity, media institutions maintain a safe distance from whistleblowers, people targeted for leaks. They go along with the aims of prosecutors, even as these cases sweep up their communications and compromise their ability to confidentially produce investigative journalism. They accept that someone must martyr themselves as a whistleblower simply because they violated the law or some rule that says whistleblowers must go through proper channels. If this remains the status quo, the world can expect that the war on whistleblowers, which is also a war on journalism, will escalate in its attacks on journalists and their sources. And it won't just be the U.S. It won't just be the Western world. It will give a green light to all regions of the world, all governments to engage in this kind of activity and then point back to the U.S. as an excuse for their behavior. I'll conclude by focusing on the Espionage Act prosecution against American drone whistleblower Daniel Hale, who deserves as much solidarity as we can give him in this hour. Like the Assange case, the investigation was launched by the Justice Department under Attorney General Eric Holder and President Barack Obama. Hale was part of the Joint Special Operations Task Force in 2012. He was part of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency from December 2013 to August 2014. Uh, he did work helping to identify, quote, targets for kill and capture. He provided documents on this targeted assassination program to Jeremy Scahill, Intercept co-founder and author of The Dirty Wars. He also authored, uh, Hale did an anonymous chapter in Scahill's book on the assassination complex. It's unclear why the Obama administration never indicted Hale, perhaps had something to do with not wanting to call further attention to the executioner and chief's role in expanding drone warfare. Yet in March 2019, the Justice Department under Trump, who was most likely enamored with the vast power to kill whomever the U.S. government designated an enemy, charged Hale with violating the Espionage Act. He was arrested in May. The pandemic delayed his trial. On March 31st, 2021, he pled guilty to one charge hoping that would satisfy the vipers at the Justice Department and limit the length of his prison sentence. At this moment, he is detained at the Alexandria Detention Center. This is the same facility where Chelsea Manning attempted suicide while she was resisting a grand jury investigating WikiLeaks. It's the same facility that factored into a district court judge in London, her decision to reject the extradition request against Julian Assange because of what could happen to him, how he would be mistreated if he was extradited to the United States. And he violated nothing in the terms of his supervised release, and yet he finds himself in jail, unable to prepare his defense for his sentencing hearing, and he'll have limited access to his attorney, and also he's someone who struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder, and he was seeing a therapist, and that is another uh, travesty about this, that he is in solitary confinement 
the government concluding that they must put him in these conditions in order to protect himself from doing self-harm. And yet we know that solitary confinement is what can cause you uh, to uh, to lose your mind, to have uh, problems that uh, lead to you needing further medical treatment. And so we should all show Daniel Hale solidarity. And uh, that's where I will conclude. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts about whistleblowing and good luck with the rest of your conference.